Which sensor is the best choice for macro photography? Medium format, 35mm, 4 thirds or even smaller. Are there benefits to using a small sensor camera or is it more of a go big or go home situation? Let's find out. My name is Thomas Eisel, I'm a professional photographer from Vienna, Austria. Two personal observations regarding macro photography and sensor size. I've recently tested a compact camera with a 1.5.3 inch sensor, the OM system TG7, and I was really surprised by the macro performance of this premium outdoor camera. Also, I noticed that many photographers specializing in macro are working with micro four thirds cameras. And when I shoot macros, I also tend to grab my micro four thirds setup. So why is that? Let's circle back to the initial question and find out whether small sensor format cameras are really better suited for macro photography. And if so, why? Spoiler alert, after watching this video, you might even consider getting a 1.5.3 inch camera for ultra macro applications. But I'm getting ahead of myself, let's cover all the bases first before we jump to any conclusions. The original definition of macro photography is based on the so-called reproduction ratio. It describes the relationship between the size of the subject in real life and its size on the film or digital sensor. Here is the formula. To calculate the reproduction ratio R, you have to divide the size of the image of the subject on the sensor by the size of the subject in the real world. In the traditional sense, macro photography starts at the reproduction ratio of 1 to 1, also called a 1 times magnification meaning that a subject with a diameter of 1 cm in the real world is reproduced on the film or sensor with a diameter of 1 cm. The higher the ratio, the greater the magnification. For example, 2 to 1 or 2 times magnification means that the subject is twice as big on the sensor as in real life. In digital photography, the classic definition is a bit problematic, as pixels are in fact dimensionless. A theoretical example. When viewed on the screen or when printed, one pixel from a 5 megapixel digital medium format camera and one pixel from a 5 megapixel smartphone camera will be the same size. This has very specific implications when it comes to macro photography and the reproduction ratio. To illustrate that, I've captured the following images at 0.5 times magnification with various camera lens combinations. The first image was captured with the Pentax 645C digital medium format camera with the HD Pentax DFA 645 90mm f2.8 macro ED AWSR lens. The second image was photographed with the Nikon D800, which has a 35mm format sensor, with the AF Micro Nikkor 60mm f2.8 D lens. The next shot was taken with the OM System OM1 4 thirds format camera, with the Suico Digital 50mm f2 macro lens. And last but not least, an image captured with the OM System TUF TG7 1.5.3 inch format compact camera with its built in 4.5 to 18 mm f2 to f4.9 lens. Quite obviously, the same reproduction ratio with different sensor formats leads to different levels of perceived magnification on a screen or print of the same size. Why? Because we examine the images at the same picture height, although the sensors vary in physical size. 
to meaningfully compare the reproduction ratios of different sensor formats in digital photography, an equivalent reproduction ratio has to be calculated. The universally accepted standard is the 35mm equivalent reproduction ratio. To calculate it, multiply the reproduction ratio of the lens by the crop factor of the sensor. So let's examine the crop factors of the cameras I used in the previous demonstration. Starting with the Nikon D800 and its 35mm sensor, we have a crop factor of 1, obviously. Moving on to the next camera, the Pentax 645C digital medium format. It has a crop factor of 0.79, so approximately 0.8. Moving on to the Micro Four Thirds OM1. It has a crop factor of 2. And last but not least, the TG7 with a crop factor of 5.56, so approximately 5.6. We can easily see why the perceived magnification is so different. The practical implications of the relationship between sensor format and reproduction ratio can be summarized in three statements. First, comparing two camera systems with different sensor formats, both equipped with lenses of similar design which provide the same angle of view, the smaller format camera is generally able to focus closer than the larger format camera. For example, a Nikkor 24-70 f2.8 designed for 35mm sensors focuses as close as 40mm, while a comparable Micro Four Thirds M Suico 12-40 f2.8 focuses as close as 20mm. Note that both lenses deliver about the same reproduction ratio, but not the same equivalent reproduction ratio. The M Suico achieves double the equivalent magnification. This effect scales linearly with sensor size. Everyone who has used a digital medium format system and a micro forward system side by side is well aware of that. Second, a smaller sensor camera can achieve very high equivalent reproduction ratios with relatively small lenses. Let's compare two DSLR lenses, the AF Micro Nikkor 60mm f2.8 D and the Suico Digital 35mm f3.5 Macro. Both provide about the same angle of view for their native sensor formats. But while the Nikkor achieves a reproduction ratio of 1 to 1, weighs 440 grams and is about 75 millimeters long, the Suico achieves an equivalent reproduction ratio of 2 to 1 at the weight of only 165 grams and a length of 53 millimeters, with the lens barrel not extended. Let me emphasize. The Suico weighs less than half and is twice as capable when it comes to magnification. This becomes even more drastic when we add the TG7 to the comparison. This premium compact camera is a true macro expert and able to achieve an equivalent magnification of 11.1 times at the weight of only around 250 grams in total. Just as a reminder, the Nikkor lens alone weighs 440 grams. Third, as we just saw with the TG7, a small sensor camera can deliver ultra-high equivalent magnifications, which are practically unobtainable with larger sensor cameras, unless specialized unwieldy equipment like macro bellows and extension tubes are used. Depth of field or better, the lack thereof, is always of concern when it comes to close-ups in general and macro photography in specific. 
the smaller the sensor, the more depth of field can be achieved at the given angle of view and subject distance with the same F number. This is a significant advantage in practice, as with a larger format camera, you either need more light, higher ISO, or advanced post-production tricks like focus stacking to get the same results. We just found out that a small sensor potentially delivers higher magnification, more depth of field, and all of that in a smaller package. Sounds too good to be true? Well, it kind of is. The image quality has to be taken into account as well. And as you've already suspected, there is no free lunch. The smaller an imaging system, the less image quality. Although the relationship is not linear, as I've mentioned in previous videos. A camera system twice as small is not twice as bad in terms of image quality. Therefore, the big question is, how small can we go, sensor and camera-wise? To put the bottom line up front, we can go very small, actually. When it comes to image quality, the question is not what is the highest achievable image quality, because then, Every macro photographer would have to shoot 8x10 slide film as it easily outresolves any digital camera on the planet, but instead the correct question has to be what is good enough. What comes next might surprise you, at least it surprised me. I've tested the TG7 in my lab recently and at ISO 100 I got a median value of 0.2 cycles per pixel at MTF 50. This means that up to 8x10 inch, this specialized camera will deliver as much resolution as most commercial printers can print, which is around 150 line widths per inch. As we can assume that with bigger print sizes the viewing distances increase, the effective resolving power of the compact camera at low ISO sensitivities is definitely sufficient. Of course, the TG7 is not as sharp in the corners as a professional grade micro four third setup, but usually a macro subject is placed in the center of the frame. So on a side note, high-end industry leading microscopes like the Leica M Spira 3 utilize a 12 megapixel 1.5.3 inch sensor quite similar to the 12 megapixel BSI sensor found in the OM system TUF TG7. Let's address a common, albeit very problematic argument in favor of choosing a larger sensor for macro photography. It is as follows. On a larger sensor, you can just crop the image and get the same equivalent reproduction ratio of the smaller sensor with equal image quality as you got more resolution and bigger pixels to work with. There are two major oversights in this argument. First, as I previously stated, pixels are dimensionless, so how big they are on the sensor is irrelevant. Only the actual resolved details and tonal values are relevant. Second, the ability to crop a digital image is almost never limited by pixel resolution, but by lens resolution. So although you might still have sufficient megapixels left after cropping, you will overstretch the lens's resolving power at some point and then the image quality deteriorates significantly. That makes you wonder why you have all these megapixels in the first place, right? But that is a topic for another video. Let's get back on track. I've prepared a practical experiment to illustrate the cropping fallacy. Taking the macro shots from earlier, I've cropped them so that they depict matching picture sections. Let's compare the results at about 200% magnification. The first shot was captured with the Pentax 645C. Still a respectable result after cropping, but definitely not spectacular.
onto the Nikon D800. Note the improved details. Here is the OM system OM1. Again, we get more and better defined details. Last but not least, the TUF TG7, a pocketable Digicam. Look at the fine scratches on the dollar that are now clearly discernible. The camera also picked up the micro reflections on the coin's structured surface. Just for fun, let's go back to the Pentax 645C image and now back to the TG7. We have a winner, I'd say. To conclude, as soon as we start cropping, the image quality advantage of a larger system quickly evaporates. There is only one common objection against using small sensors left that needs to be addressed, and that is high ISO performance. A few things to keep in mind when it comes to macro photography. In many cases, you will use a tripod, allowing for longer shutter speeds and low ISO settings. In most other cases, when capturing ultra-close macros, for example, the camera casts a shadow on the subject, so flash is mandatory anyway. Also, to achieve the same depth of field with a small sensor camera, you can use a larger F number, which gives you more light per unit area. As a result, a lower ISO setting will suffice. So in my experience, ISO performance is practically a non-factor. If you still feel like ISO might be a showstopper, remember the film days when ISO 400 was considered fast and people got amazing macro shots nonetheless. Oh, and before I move on, here is an image shot with the TG7 at ISO 400, out of camera JPEG, no noise reduction. To call it usable is a serious understatement, I'd say. All in all, it is fair to conclude that the smaller sensor camera is the sensible choice when high reproduction ratios are needed. The truth is that when it comes to macro photography, how small you are willing to go sensor-wise depends mostly on the voice in your head and not on actual image quality requirements. What really prevents you from getting good macro shots in practice is not having the right tool in terms of reproduction ratio and portability. Taking the pocketable 11.1 times magnification OM system TG7 with an attached ring flash diffuser everywhere is effortless, while bringing the Nikon D800 with a macro bellows and a macro flash is not. So pick the right tool for the job. Don't hesitate to go small, because the more you practice with a camera that you actually bring along, the better your macro photography skills will get and the better your photos will be. Getting excellent results with the smallest conceivable setup is a testament to your skill as a photographer, while having a large setup just for the sake of it is overcompensation. Thank you very much for watching. Please consider subscribing and following me on other social media. See you next time. Thank you.